This is Anna and Brian Walsh. Anna went missing from her home in Cohasset, Massachusetts on New Year's Day of 2023. Police consider her disappearance suspicious, and her whereabouts remain unknown as of the date of this upload. Police also allege that during an interview on January 4th, Brian intentionally gave officers untruthful statements in an effort to mislead and delay investigators. As a result, he was arrested by police days later. Brian, what do you want the public to know about this case? By any reasonable measure, Anna Walsh was living the American dream. She turned one of her favorite phrases, if it's to be, it's up to me, into her mantra. Anna worked her way up from an entry-level hotel job to a highly compensated executive position in a field she enjoyed. By the time she turned 38, she was married with three children ages 2, 4, and 6, and had acquired millions of dollars worth of assets, including properties in affluent areas. Anna was born in Belgrade, Serbia, and was educated there before coming to the United States in 2005 on an exchange visitor visa. Anna earned additional credentials from Cornell University. She is fluent in multiple languages. Anna has always been highly ambitious and began her career in the hospitality industry with seasonal work as a housekeeping attendant. Over the years, she worked various jobs of increasing responsibility at top hotels in Boston. She is most recently employed as regional general manager for the real estate company Tishman Spire in the Washington, D.C. area. In the summers of 2005 and 2006, Anna worked at the Inn at Little Washington in Virginia. She met and began dating the senior chef, Mr. Mark Nipp, and they married in 2008. After spending some time in New York City, Anna moved to Lenox, Massachusetts to accept a managerial position at the luxury hotel The Wheatley in the Berkshires. For Anna, The managerial role was yet another step forward in a career built on hard work and determination. Forty-seven-year-old Brian Walsh was born into a life of wealth and opportunity. His father, Dr. Thomas Walsh, was a prominent physician and a hospital chief of neurology who taught at Harvard. Brian had the privilege of attending top boarding schools and colleges such as Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Northeastern University, and the JFK School of Government at Harvard. However, he was a troubled youth, and his parents considered him an underachiever. According to one court document, Brian was told by his family he was a loser and that they should never have had him. He was also told by relatives that he was a lost cause who had no chance of making anything out of himself. A close friend of Dr. Walsh, who has known Brian since he was a young boy, stated, As Brian got older, he sort of lost touch with how people make it in the world and assumed a mantle of entitlement. There were signs he was a con artist. Others would describe Brian as someone who used his charisma and communication skills to swindle people out of money rather than seek legitimate employment. For example, on one occasion, according to an FBI affidavit, he borrowed $500,000 from a friend but never paid the friend back despite a written agreement. According to a court document, a friend of Dr. Walsh's named Jeffrey Ornstein stated Brian had received treatment at the Austin Riggs Psychiatric Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Ornstein also claimed Brian had been diagnosed as a sociopath, likely meaning he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. According to local reports, Brian had grown accustomed to living lavishly and regularly hosted $20,000 dinners. He claimed his money came from creating a software program and he earned additional income as a consultant. Brian worked mightily to present the image of a successful businessman, but those who knew him well had serious doubts about where the money came from. 
From 2006 to 2007, Brian was accused of stealing nearly $1 million of his father's money through an elaborate real estate scam. This was the final straw for his father. Upon learning of the fraud, Dr. Walsh disinherited Brian from his estate. By 2008, Brian had estranged himself from all of his paternal family. In 2011, Brian attempted to sell two Andy Warhol paintings to a New York City gallery. However, the gallery suspected something was off and declined the transaction when Brian could not produce a bill of sale. Nothing came of this incident. In 2013, Brian was indicted for larceny after he deposited more than $32,000 in bad checks into his checking account. He agreed to a continuance without finding and completed a term of probation. A continuance without finding is an agreement with the court where the defendant admits there's enough evidence to convict. In exchange, the defendant usually gets probation without a formal conviction on their record. Three years later, in March 2014, Brian and Anna began a romantic relationship shortly after she divorced her husband. But she was doing well. Uh, by all accounts, the mm -hmm. friend said that the job that she got in Washington, D.C., um, was a good one. And Brian himself said in court documents in, you know, asking for leniency in the sentencing for the art fraud, uh, she got a better job. She has a great income. She's got great benefits. And I, I can't move to Washington because of our situation. Um, so, so obviously that might lend something else to this whole metric of how their relationship might have been. Absolutely. So if Brian was uh, feeling bad about himself because he financially was not measuring up, he probably considered himself a loser financially, was under a lot of financial duress, uh, which really increases mental health issues. So it increases a person's depression, anxiety, rage level, in some cases, suicidality. And I would imagine and that Brian was very jealous of his wife. Brian and Anna made an instant connection. The well-heeled couple enjoyed traveling, fine dining, and hosting lavish dinner parties for friends. When Anna needed to center herself, she relied on one of her favorite pastimes, retail therapy. However, the burgeoning relationship had its problems. According to a police complaint filed in Washington, D.C. in August of 2014, Anna told officers that Brian threatened to kill her and her friend during a phone conversation. At the time, Anna was in Washington, D.C. and Brian was in Boston. Police closed the matter after Anna refused to cooperate with the investigation. Nevertheless, she decided to build a life with Brian. In December 2015, Brian and Anna got married. According to a witness, they married in front of a few dozen family members and friends. Although, according to the witness, none of Brian's family was present. Now married, Anna resumed her ambitious plan to develop her career potential, whereas Brian was up to his old tricks. In November 2016, Brian listed two Andy Warhol paintings on eBay for sale. The original asking price was $100,000 for the pair. Brian arranged to meet with the buyer's representative at the Four Seasons Hotel. The pieces were sold outside of eBay for $80,000. Days later, the buyer removed the painting's frames and noticed no authentication stamps. The buyer made multiple unsuccessful attempts to reach Brian. Finally, he was able to find a contact number for Brian's mother and asked her to have Brian call him back. Instead, the buyer got a call from her attorney, who said Brian's mother was not responsible for her son, but Brian would call him soon. A few days later, the buyer located Anna and called her at work. That's when Brian responded. He said he was surprised to learn the pieces were phony and would be happy to return the full amount. Unfortunately, after weeks of delays, the buyer had received just $30,000. Meanwhile, Anna thrived at work. On April 15, 2016, she purchased a two-bedroom condominium in Lynn, Massachusetts. The property was in her name and became the couple's primary residence. Soon after, the Walshes had their first child, and everything seemed to be going well on the surface. But unfortunately, one interested party could have been more impressed with Brian's antics. In May 2018, at 6 a.m., 
federal agents raided the Walsh residence. They searched for and discovered evidence of fraud involving the sale of fake art. Brian was arrested and released to home confinement. He was fitted with an ankle bracelet and a hearing was scheduled for October. Just weeks before the hearing, Brian's father passed away. In his will, he wrote, I leave my son, Brian Walsh, my best wishes, but nothing else. According to an affidavit, a close friend of Dr. Walsh said Brian did everything in his power to contest the validity of his father's will. When that failed, he allegedly confiscated and tore the will into pieces, but not before Dr. Walsh's close friend took pictures of it. Furthermore, Brian was accused of taking millions of dollars from his father's estate following his death. In October 2018, a federal grand jury indicted Brian on wire fraud, interstate transportation for a scheme to defraud, possession of converted goods, and unlawful monetary transaction. Prosecutors allege that Brian was handed authentic artwork from a friend to sell on the friend's behalf, but had the pieces replicated. Then, he attempted to sell the replicas while refusing to return the authentic pieces to the friend or compensate him. Anna was not implicated in the scheme. Brian pleaded not guilty to all charges, and the case was bound over to trial. Brian bought his wife a Maserati luxury vehicle four months after his indictment. Anna took to social media to share the news and a picture of her good fortune. As Brian was facing legal consequences, Anna continued to prosper. On November 6, 2020, she bought a five-bedroom, four-bath, single-family home at 725 Jerusalem Road in Cohasset for $800,000. Six months later, on April Fool's Day, 2021, Brian agreed to plead guilty to the federal charges in exchange for a recommended sentence of supervised release, fines, restitution, and forfeiture. He also agreed to either return the artworks or pay for them. Brian was placed on monitoring and house arrest as part of pre-sentencing probation. The ankle bracelet did not include GPS tracking, but would alert authorities if he was out of range. He could leave the house with advance requests, but had to detail the specific locations, times, and reasons. A sentencing hearing was scheduled for October 6. In a letter to the judge from Brian's mother asking for leniency, dated August 26, 2021, Miss Walsh stated, I do not have a good relationship with Anna, perhaps due to cultural differences. She asked the judge not to imprison Brian, claiming, He will never put us through such trauma again. However, just before the scheduled hearing, prosecutors learned that he had allegedly looted his late father's estate draining his dad's bank accounts, and selling off his valuables. Consequently, the judge postponed Brian's sentencing to investigate the possible embezzlement. Around this time, Anna began to make a series of significant moves. In February 2022, Anna accepted a high-profile position as an executive at the Tishman Spire Realty Firm in Washington, D.C. Weeks after, she bought a $1.3 million townhouse in the affluent town of Chevy Chase, Maryland. Back in Massachusetts, Anna sold their primary residence at 725 Jerusalem Road. Purchased in 2020 for $800,000, it now sold for $1,385,000. Then, the family moved to a $1 million rental property in Cohasset. Anna and the family settled into a new routine that involved her spending weekdays in D.C. and weekends with the family back home in Cohasset. In the months before New Year's Day of 2023, friends said Anna appeared to be in a hurry to liquidate assets in the Boston area. She had recently sold a car and sold her Boston condo in a separate transaction. The condo buyer paid over $200,000 in cash on December 29. The buyer was interviewed by a local media outlet and stated she felt rushed to complete the deal. She said, I had the sense that she did want to move along to wrap it up quickly and relocate to Washington, D.C. All properties were in Anna's name. On Christmas Day of 2022, Anna texted an unusual request to her mother, who was in Serbia then. She reportedly begged her mother to drop everything and visit her in Washington, D.C. the next day. Her mother replied that she could not possibly do so on such short notice. In an interview with Fox News Digital, her mother stated, Clearly, there must have been some problems. Anna did not give a reason for the urgency.
On December 31st, 2022, Brian and Anna hosted a New Year's Eve dinner at their home with a close friend named Jem. Around midnight, Anna spoke to a friend on her cell phone to wish her a Happy New Year. Next, she called her mother and sister, but neither answered. As Anna had to be at work the next day, she planned on going to bed shortly after Jem left. Records show that Anna was scheduled for a flight from Boston to D.C. on New Year's Day. According to a police statement, on Wednesday, January 4th, the Cohasset Police Department responded to a call for a welfare check at the Walsh residence. The caller stated he was the head of security for Tishman Spire, Miss Walsh's workplace. He said he contacted Brian, who was unaware of her whereabouts and had not filed a missing person report. Brian told the caller that Anna left for work on Sunday at 6.30 a.m., and he had not heard from her since. Cahasset police arrived at the Walsh residence for a well-being check, according to an affidavit. Officers asked Brian to provide a timeline of events for January 1st and 2nd. According to Brian, the Walshes hosted Jem for dinner on New Year's Eve. Jem left around 1 or 1.30 a.m., and he and Anna went to bed shortly after that. Anna said she had to be in D.C. for a work emergency in the morning. According to Brian, Anna kissed him goodbye and left sometime between 6 to 7 a.m. She would typically take a rideshare or taxi to the airport. Brian claims he got up at 7 a.m. on New Year's Day and made breakfast for the kids. He had previously requested permission to leave the house from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. to drop off his mother, who was staying in his house, to recover from cataract surgery. However, he said his mother had recovered sooner than expected and drove herself home before 3 p.m. When a babysitter arrived, he left to run errands around 3 p.m. He then left again around 4 p.m. to see his mother in Swampscott. He said he did not have his phone with him then, as one of the kids likely took it and lost it. Therefore, he could not use GPS. He explains that this is why he got lost and took an additional 20 to 30 minutes to get to his mother's house. After arriving at his mother's condo, he went to CVS and Whole Foods to buy groceries and cleaning wipes for her before returning home at around 8 p.m. Brian states he found his cell phone the next day underneath a pillow. He states that on January 2nd, he only left the house once to take his eldest son out for ice cream while a babysitter watched the younger kids. Before the officers left, Brian consented to a forensic download of his cell phone. On January 5th, the Cohasset Police Department announced that Anna Walsh was missing. They asked the public for assistance with information. They said she was last seen shortly after midnight on New Year's Day by a relative staying in the house, according to a statement by Cohasset Police Chief William Quigley. On January 6th, police launched a massive search for Anna, including canine units and search and rescue teams in the wooded areas near her home. At the same time, a fire broke out at Anna's former residence at 725 Jerusalem Road. Officials said the home's current residents were the ones who called 911. Chief Quigley acknowledged the connection, stating, It's a very strange coincidence. He said they would investigate any possible link between Walsh's disappearance and the fire. On January 7, a team of investigators performed a video canvas of the North Shore area to verify Brian's timeline of events. As it turns out, investigators were able to determine there was no video evidence of Brian at Whole Foods or CVS on January 1st, as he had stated. In addition, there were no receipts to prove that he went. However, investigators did find video evidence of Brian at a Home Depot in Rockland the following day. He was seen wearing a black surgical mask and blue surgical gloves and purchased $450 worth of cleaning supplies with cash, including a tarp, bucket, and tape. That trip was not disclosed to officers and may have also been a probation violation. Cell phone data obtained from Brian's phone through forensic download showed the device traveled to Brockton and Abington during the week beginning January 1st. These towns are not on Brian's approved list for leave and may also amount to probation violations. Regrettably, later in the evening, Cohasset Police and Massachusetts State Police announced that the search for Anna Walsh in Massachusetts had concluded. On Sunday, January 8th, Brian Walsh was taken into police custody. He faced charges of misleading police during the investigation into Anna's disappearance. The Massachusetts Department of Children and Families took custody of the couple's children. Earlier in the day, investigators searched Anna's townhome in D.C. and found her car in the driveway. There were no signs she had been there recently. 
On January 9th, Brian made his first appearance in court. Mr. Brian Walsh, it's complaint 230136 out of Cohasset. You're charged with intimidation of a witness on the 8th of January, 2023. A not guilty plea will be entered. Do you understand that charge, Mr. Walsh? Yes. I'll hear from the Commonwealth. Yes. Good morning, Your Honor. Lynn B. Lynn for the Commonwealth. Your Honor, the charge before the court right now, the defendant is charged under the intimidation, that being misleading the police in the course of an investigation. The investigation was into the missing person of Anna Walsh. Anna is the wife of this defendant. She's 37 years old. They have three children, two, four, and six. Anna Walsh was last seen on New Year's Day about between 4 and 6 a.m. in the morning. The defendant indicated that she left the house to go. She works in Washington, D.C. The defendant indicated in the subsequent interview that she left the house around 6 a.m. taking an Uber or Lyft to go to the airport where she was going to go to work in D.C. That was the last time she was seen. In the course of the investigation, police were notified around January 4th by her employees in Washington, D.C. that she had not shown up for work on January 4th. That was the first time that she was notified that she was missing. Up until this point, the defendant had not notified anyone that she was missing. The investigation was determined that she actually had a plane ticket for January 3rd, which she did not use and did not show up at the airport nor her D.C. job or her apartment in D.C. It was indicated that the defendant, they checked, police checked during the course of this investigation. There was not a Uber or any kind of Lyft that had picked her up on January 1st. In fact, in the course of the investigation, it was determined that her cell phone pinged in the area of the house, which is located on Chief Justice Cushing Way, that her phone pinged on the 1st and the 2nd, which is after the defendant had said she had left. Additionally, the defendant right now was on house arrest pending sentencing in federal court. Part of that probation and condition, he was to report his whereabouts if he was to leave the house. He indicated as part of the investigation when police spoke with him that on January 1st, he went to his mother's house. However, it took him a lot longer because he got lost going to his mother's house in Swampskin. He also subtly indicated and stated to the police that he went to Whole Foods and CVS. Police subsequently did surveillance and checked. There was no surveillance or indication that he went to Whole Foods, no CVS. He indicated he purchased some items. There's no receipts for him having purchased that. He then returned home. Surveillance was checked by several police during this time frame. These statements caused a lot of delay as part of the investigation as police now were focusing on the North Shore. He further indicated that on January 2nd, as he was supposed to report in, that the only time he left is that he went to take his son for some ice cream. Surveillance checked during the investigation indicated that the defendant, in fact, on January 2nd, sometime after 4 o'clock, went to the Home Depot, which is in Portland. He's on surveillance at that time purchasing about $450 worth of cleaning supplies. That would include mops, bucket, tops, Tevex, drop cloths, as well as various kinds of tape. He's on surveillance at that time on January 2nd, even though he said he never left the house. Police obtained a search warrant and actually searched the house with crime scene services. During that time, they found blood in the basement. Blood was found in the basement area, as well as a knife, which also contained some blood. Could you repeat that last time, Ms. Stiff? Yes. In the basement, crime scene services recovered and found blood in the basement area, in a section of the basement. There was also a knife that was found. 
on the knife, there was also blood, uh, and part of the knife was damaged. Your Honor, um, these various statements caused a delay uh, in the investigation to the point that during the time frame when he didn't report his wife and gave various statements, that allowed him time to either clean up evidence, uh, dispose of evidence, um, in causing a delay. Uh, as of this time, uh, Anna Walsh has not been found. Um, so because of that, the Commonwealth is asking 500000 cash bail. At this time, these are the charges. Good morning, Your Honor. Mr. Walsh's wife has been missing um, since January 1st, and it is true that her employer um, contacted the police on January 4th. However, that was as a result of Mr. Walsh, Brian Walsh, contacting the employer to say, I haven't heard from my wife. Um, the employer suggested that their security team, who was a former law enforcement officer, uh, contact both the Cohasset Police and, and the D.C. Metro Police, which he did. Mr. Walsh has given several interviews. We have consented to searches of his home. We have consented to searches of his property. We have consented to searches of his cell phone. I negotiated with a D First Assistant D District Attorney, I to promote you, um, Lynn Beeland, on the terms of that to protect attorney client. He has, been, he has been incredibly cooperative. The charges are not anything relating, uh, he's not charged with murder. He's charged with uh, misleading investigators by not saying, as I understand it, he went to Home Depot um, in, in Nor well, in Rockland. He did say he went to press in um, Norwell. And um, as Your Honor knows, Rockland, Rockland Home Depot was right next to Norwell. Um, if, in fact, he was there, it was, it was next in the town next to him. With respect um, to the other alleged omission is that he was in Brockton and um, Abington. They don't have him stopping anywhere in those areas, as far as the police report says. Um, he did say that he took his son out twice on um, the second. He is on home confinement. He has a bracelet on him. Um, there's, this is a violation has been um, noticed of him. So if he um, leaves here, he will, there's a federal detainer. He will be taken to federal court. And I would suggest that on the bail violations in federal court, the appropriate place to decide those conditions of release is, is in the federal court. I would ask uh, for low bail or no bail and to let the federal courts um, decide, it, decide this. Um, he's not going anywhere. He hasn't gone anywhere since January 1st. He's been in the house. That's true. He's been in the house with police almost 12 hours a day. I've been at the house with him with police for at least eight hours a day. Well, not yesterday. But um, yesterday the police were at his house and he was at my home. Um, but Friday and Saturday, I was at his house for at least eight hours um, with police officers present. So it's not that he's been there changing evidence um, or somehow impeding the investigation. The charges are he neglected to, to mention that he went to Abington and Brockton, and that he neglected to mention that he was at a Home Depot. I suggest on those charges, um, a regular person, as everybody has to be treated, um, that that would be a no bail situation. The federal, with respect to violation of conditions of his federal bail, that is most appropriately dealt with in the federal court. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Bail is set at five hundred thousand dollars cash, five million dollars surety. Can we get a thirty-day date, Miss Minor, please? Uh, what date would you like? You tell me. Any any. Dave, he would be, uh, we would do this by teleconference from the House of Correction. Okay. Richie, I want you to keep the, uh, yeah, if I can I just have a look. copy of the warrant. So keep that in the file, please. Thank you. Bail is set at $500,000 cash. You have a right to appeal that bill to the Superior Court. If you make this bill and get arrested or charged with any more offense while this case is pending, you could be held up to 90 days without bail. We're going to pick a conference date within 30 days. Yeah. Is Thursday, February 9th available? Thursday, February 9th is perfect. 
Thank you. February 9th. Our video meeting is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Although Brian's attorney stated Brian was the first to contact the police to report on a missing, police records contradict this claim. The police logs show Anna's employer was the first to contact the police. The judge set bail at $500,000 cash, and the next hearing was set for February 9. Prosecutors disclosed that investigators obtained a warrant to search the Walsh residence in Cohasset and discovered blood and a bloody knife in the basement. In addition, investigators had found no evidence of Anna taking a ride chair from their house on January 1st. They also referred to Anna's disappearance as suspicious. According to a report by CNN, investigators searched dumpsters in Swampscott near Brian's mother's house. They also dug through trash at a transfer station in Peabody and found a hacksaw, torn up cloth material, and possible bloodstains. In addition, investigators examined Brian's internet records. They found he had searched for how to dispose of a 115 pound woman's body and how to dismember a body. A Cohasset police log shows that Anna's phone last pinged around a mile from the family home at 3.14 a.m. on January 2nd. Afterward, investigators turned their focus from a missing persons case to a possible homicide. According to a report by 7 News on Wednesday, January 11th, Massachusetts State Police acquired video evidence of Brian Walsh at a dumpster in the hours after his wife's disappearance on January 1st. The camera is located close to a Whole Foods market, one of the stores Brian told officers he stopped at while running errands for his mother on New Year's Day. Detectives from the Cohasset Police Department and the Massachusetts State Police Detectives assigned to the Norfolk District Attorney's Office have been involved in an intensive investigation into the fate of Anna Walsh a 39-year-old Cohasset mother of three, since she was first reported missing on January 4th. Early in this investigation, the police developed probable cause to believe that her husband, Brian Walsh, age 47, had misled police investigators on material matters important to the search for Anna Walsh. He has pled not guilty to those charges and is currently being held at the Norfolk County House of Correction. The continued investigation has now allowed police to obtain an arrest warrant charging Brian Walsh with the murder of his wife. Mr. Walsh will be transported to the Quincy District Court for arraignment on the charge of murder. Additional details of the investigation and the evidence in support of those charges are likely to be presented at arraignment but will not be disclosed at this time. This marks the second allegation of domestic violence homicide in Norfolk County in less than a month. Our thoughts are very much with the family these crimes have left behind.